So, what we're talking about today. This is a presentation about video, primarily video content, and how operators can and potentially should invest in such content. Why are we talking about it? Well, the video market's changing. A fun metaphor that we sometimes use in the office is of trains pulling into and out of a station. So, telco TV is an established trend. Europe and North America have over a decade of IPTV experience. Major operators in Asia and Latin America have established services. And even slightly later to market players in the Middle East and North Africa have established credible IPTV services in the last couple of years that are starting to gain scale. I know that OSN in the Middle East has started to bow to pressure and reduce prices and increase the flexibility of its packages. I'd say that's a clear result of increased IPTV pressure in the region. One of the changes that's still ongoing, and where I feel some players have boarded the train, but others are still waiting to buy their ticket, is the changing role of video on demand. This is something that we're going to look at today, and it has all sorts of knock-on effects. The amount of time that people spend viewing on-demand content is growing, primarily driven by OTT use, but this is trickling into traditional pay TV viewing as well. The role of video content is also changing, and this is becoming a more pressing concern for operators in particular. One sees players like BT that have invested literally billions in sport and have seen a corresponding ramp up in both broadband and TV revenues, an increasing number of IPTV players as well as OTT players investing in original dramatic content. Video content could be one of the big differentiators for IPTV propositions in the future. But these issues need to be thought about now, or no later than now, otherwise it will be too late to differentiate on this basis. The decision changes from one of leading the field and deciding how will I differentiate, to one of how do I make sure I don't get left behind if action isn't taken soon. So really, the train is leaving the station. Of course, one might fear that investing heavily in something as risky as video content could sound like one is jumping on the bandwagon. So I'll try and explain how and when it's appropriate to invest, and also how I think content investment is really a train to the future that we're talking about, rather than a bandwagon. So this presentation can be broadly divided into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the changing way that consumers are viewing content. An important part of this change is the shift from broadcast viewing to on-demand. I'll then look at why an operator might invest in video content, and what some of the potential alternatives might be to that. Finally, I'll look at what types of content investment might make best sense for particular types of player. As I said earlier, all of this research is based on a series of reports that we've been working on, plus our own interviews and conversations with pay TV providers and operators from around the world. We've produced much more material than I can cover in this session, so do please access the associated reports or the free summary versions of those reports if you're not currently a subscriber. That's all available on analysismason.com. My contact details are going to be at the end of this presentation as well, incidentally. So, thinking about the role of VOD, let's start with an example. The European pay TV player Sky announced a couple of weeks ago that it plans to launch its full pay TV portfolio over unmanaged IP in the next year. Previously, it's relied heavily on satellite for its video delivery. And I'd argue that Sky's announcement is symptomatic of a much larger change within the TV industry. So let's divide the ramifications of that up into short, medium and long term. In the short term, this move will increase Sky's addressable market. They reckon about 6 million homes in their footprint can't or will not put up a satellite dish, for example. On top of that, Sky has about 2 million broadband customers in the UK at the moment that don't take its pay TV service. This is a very simple route to upsell for those customers. Of course, this whole thing could also be seen as a defensive move. Sky needs to innovate and its net additions at present are being driven almost entirely by its now TV service rather than by its traditional pay TV services. In the medium term, I'd say that Sky's move to IP delivery is symptomatic of a wider shift in the industry that drives on-demand video in a big way. If we look at the Sky Q interface specifically, and EPG design more widely, the design trend has moved much towards search and discover. Netflix, Amazon Video, and all of the big OTT players are focusing on content recommendation and content discovery. Sky has a channel called Sky Atlantic that focuses on HBO and similar content to that. And it announced in its most recent earnings call that 75% of that content is viewed on demand rather than live. 
That's that's a really significant milestone. A TV channel that's three times more likely to be watched on demand than it is live. The SkyQ interface already delivers a lot of its VOD content over IP seamlessly. That This move to all IP delivery then removes any final technical constraints on the mix of linear to on-demand delivery. The consumer need, nay expectation, that operators are trying to meet here is to deliver what the consumer wants in the manner that they want it, when they want it. This flexibility is increasingly delivered by on-demand viewing. Greater pricing flexibility, content bundles that better fit customer inclination and so on. The future shape of pay TV services and bundles is likely to be rather different to that which we see today. We're only weeks away from publishing the results of our latest consumer smartphone analytics research. In it, the average UK smartphone user used 2.1 OTT comms apps alongside the native voice and messaging apps and an average of 1.8 dedicated streaming video apps. Such multi-app usage is only going to grow and hence unified search curated by players such as pay TV providers will start to play a more central role. We're already seeing this in the Nordics, for example, where HBO Nordic and Netflix sit alongside operator propositions on the set-top box. Differentiation at this point will be based on the quality of search, on broader quality of experience, on being a trusted brand, but also on the ownership of unique content, as demonstrated by many players mounting original content budgets. Pay TV providers' role then must be remain the most effective curators of content, particularly their own exclusive content. This shift in the number of relationships that a typical consumer has with paid for video services must necessarily prompt a shift in how we approach pay TV audiences. In the traditional universe, we really treated customers in two large groups. Those that paid for the pay TV services, which is bottom left, and those that were happy enough with free-to-air services, top left. A subset of both of these audiences would pay for physical video, which is the, the green overlay. So I propose that we now have four distinct audiences for services, and that each audience has different needs. Different propositions are appropriate for each of these two. The audiences for free-to-air and traditional pay TV still exist, but we also move to a world with hybrid solutions where OTT services sit alongside an otherwise free-to-air audience or alongside pay TV services. This increase in audience types grows the potential customer base for paid-for video services and it also crucially increases the audience for video on-demand services. Putting this change into numbers, we forecast that on-demand will account for 26% of paid-for video spend by 2021. This chart shows our forecast for the percentage of paid-for video spend that can be attributed to video on demand in Europe. The percentage of spend associated with VOD is much higher in this region than in, say, Asia or the Middle East in the immediate future, but I do believe that this will become a relevant trend in those regions over time as well. Indeed, generational trends seem to support this increase in on-demand video consumption. If we look at Ofcom's recent communications market review results, we see that the average 11 to 15 year old watches over 70 minutes of video clips online every single day. This trend is also supported by the pricing models that accompany subscription VOD. OTT's low price is attracting first time paying subscribers, which swells overall spend on OTT, sorry, on VOD. So the first key message that I would like you to take away from today's presentation is that VOD is important and it's going to increase in importance. And that's going to have knock-on effects on decisions about content investment, for example. The next point I'd like to discuss is why and whether it makes commercial sense to invest in exclusive or original content as an operator. So, content investment is escalating rapidly. On the surface, we may be shocked by the production cost of some of these things, like $10 million plus for a 10-episode series. But let's not forget that at its height, the TV series Friends was costing $10 million US dollars per episode. The scale of uh, costs isn't actually the big change, even so, though some of these numbers are phenomenal. It's who, making, who is making the investment that is changing, and that's what's interesting. So two of the greatest arenas of investment are those of original drama, which I've colored red on this screen, and, and sport, which I've colored blue. Traditionally, this was a space that initially belonged to tra sort of traditional pay TV and public service broadcasters. Then 
Four years ago, Netflix aired its first original series, House of Cards. Since then, its original content spend has ballooned year on year, so now we're talking over six billion US dollars a year. Amazon Video is catching up with Netflix too, both in terms of the size of investment and now in terms of geographic availability. In some respects, Amazon is the more significant competitor to traditional operators due to its Amazon streaming partner program. As operators have sought to scale their pay TV business, so too they've increased their spend in exclusive sports content, particularly in football or soccer, as I believe it's referred to in international English. Operators such as Mobistar, BT and Turkcell have joined more traditional sports-centric broadcasters such as BN Sports in gaining exclusive coverage of certain sports in particular countries. What's making things even more interesting is that some of these players are now starting to diversify into the middle ground. Movistar, the Spanish arm of Telefonica, has significantly invested in football, motorsport and tennis rights, but in January it also committed 70 million euros per year to original drama productions, with the aim of becoming, in their own words, the biggest producers in Spanish globally. Even dedicated sports broadcasters such as BN are investing in films and series, though theirs is through output deals rather than necessarily through direct production. What's more, OTT players, having previously focused on original drama, have more recently, on occasion, expressed interest in getting into the sports game. Facebook, through Facebook Live, have demonstrated positive proof of concept for the unmanaged delivery of live sporting content. And I saw in the news literally just this morning that they're looking to strike a deal with Major League Baseball to stream as much as one game per week through the service. We're ending up with a whole load of competing interests and players. And so it makes sense to ask the question, should I be investing in content as an operator? The key variables that all operators are trying to affect through these investments are really revenue. It's, significant message to, it's a significant message to shareholders and the engine to paying shareholder dividends. Profitability and controlling costs is an important part of that. Increasing coverage and scale, so TV can help widen one audience both nationally and internationally, not just for video services but also for telecom services. And of course, customer attention is vital, and video could potentially help with that. How does the video strategy help achieve these things? Well, certain things are within an operator's control, which I've represented here by a green circle. And certain things are not directly within their control. Externalities, if you will, that I've illustrated here in blue. Operators can influence these things, but only indirectly. So, operators control pricing, subject to regulation, and telcos in particular have lots of room to manoeuvre. Because they generate margins on core broadband and voice services, they may be able to offer TV more comfortably at lower margins. How content is distributed is another vital element of the evolution of TV services, much as we discussed earlier in the Sky example, but also in terms of CDNs, device availability, and that kind of thing. Finally, operators can directly control what content they acquire and how much of the content is unique. The acquisition of unique content is a clear differentiator. We'll look at content investment more specifically and see how it's worked for some particular companies. Now, my apologies that I believe on the next slide we've had a slight rendering issue, so you can't actually read the, the title of the charts. I'll explain them as we go along. Bear in mind that in the top right-hand corner of your screen, you should see a couple of little arrows which will allow you to make uh, your window, your view of the slides full screen if you haven't already, which may help. Anyway, this first chart looks at UK incumbents BT sport investments and their potential impact on the company's financials. I'm using their reported numbers, which means that we can't isolate the impact of any one factor clearly, but what we can do is get a sense of BT's multi-billion pound investment in sport and its potential impact. The pale blue bars show BT's quarterly revenue from broadband and TV combined, which is how they report it. The dark blue bars show explicitly how much they've been spending on content. A very simple subtraction of one value from the other gives an indication of the relative impact of sports on margins. That's the line running along this chart showing the difference between those two numbers. 
We can use this as a simplistic proxy for profitability, and as you can see, it's remained relatively flat. What the investment does appear to show, however, is that the operator has scaled significantly over this three-year period. BT have been investing heavily in fiber over this same time period, so we can't attribute the increase in quarterly revenues from 300 to 500 million pounds per quarter solely to sport. But we do know, for example, that over that time, the operator has gained over 5.2 million BT sport customers, and that's really, really significant growth. Sport appears to have a long return on investment time for BT, but it has helped them to increase their core revenue. Their profitability appears to be controlled. They've widened their audience through wholesale offers for BT Sport, and they probably have some upside related to, upside related to churn. So overall, it's quite a positive story. This chart on the right shows Netflix's reporting. So I'm looking at this really from the point of view of investment in, in drama series more than anything else. And this is a business of large counterbalancing forces. When you look at their streaming businesses alone, it looks quite positive. But for example, this ignores all of their marketing costs, which are quite significant. So the dark blue bar minus the light blue bar in this chart gives us what they call their streaming contribution margin, which is the top line on the chart. And it looks quite good, increasing towards 20% margin even. But when you look at the overall margin of the business, which is when they include all of the overheads like marketing, it's sticking in low single digits. But again, scale is the major thing that all of this content investment is bringing. It's drawing people in, and as a telco, you've got plenty more services to sell to people once you've drawn them in. We've only looked at content as a route to video success here. Of course, content isn't the only solution. A few months ago, we produced a report looking at low-budget approaches to video strategy. The recommendations from that report are sound suggestions even in a scenario where one does also invest in content. So specifically, to summarize those, partnerships can be extremely beneficial. They can provide alternative routes to gain video content affordably. This could include integration of a VOD platform within your own user interface, or it could involve white labeling a third-party platform or service. The Roku Powered initiative from platform provider Roku, which powers Sky's Now TV service, is one such partnership that has yielded success for operators such as Telstra in Australia. Innovation can take many forms. Device and EPG innovation and differentiation are increasingly important in markets where all TV propositions look the same or similar. Especially if one is not differentiating on the basis of content, then features such as 4K, integration of third-party services, and unified search can significantly improve quality of experience. Engaging wider audience can indeed be achieved through content investment, but new demographics can also be unlocked through, for example, TV light propositions. I can't recall the precise stats, but in the UK, a significant percentage of both Talk Talk TV and Now TV customers said that they had not previously considered a pay TV service. The key attractors in this case were flexibility in price and contract durations. So, if you've decided that content investment is for you, then there are still a whole lot of other questions to answer. Identifying what content to invest in is no simple matter. The choice of what content genres to invest in is at the core of a self-reinforcing cycle that I've illustrated here. First of all, viewing habits are changing. Sports viewing figures ebb and flow on annual and two yearly cycles, depending on sports seasons and large events such as the World Cup and the Olympics, which happen on alternating four-year cycles. Dramatic content, particularly episodic dramas, are on the ascending, OTT services have a large part to play in this as people binge watch box sets. Non-scripted or reality TV viewing is relatively consistent at the moment. It's cheap to produce and when it works, it works well, such as with the show The Voice, which has been uh, exported to somewhere around 50 markets. Then it can work very well indeed. Factual content is slightly increasing in importance to consumers. This has been the Discovery Network's bread and butter for a long time. But big-ticket documentaries such as Netflix's Making of a Murderer and BBC's Planet Earth 2 are gaining traction. And finally, the short-form content. Depending on who you ask, such viewing is going up or going down. If you look at the youth market, then there's plenty of activity, as I mentioned earlier. I think we're still waiting for a major pay-TV success story with short-form content. 
these changes in viewing habits directly affect studios' willingness to greenlight new series. Investment in original episodic drama is an extremely hot area at the moment, with headline levels of investment. As investment changes, rights holders are adjusting the content rights windows that dictate when a show can air and on what platform. Theatrical windows are getting shorter. The sale of physical media is giving way to electronic sell-through, and both windows are moving earlier. The VOD window has also therefore moved forwards, and the time from initial release to pay TV broadcast have also reduced. In some situations, content is now available on all platforms simultaneously, or VOD actually preempts broadcast. All of these changes to rights windows help to stimulate the rising importance of VOD and encourages the blurring of boundaries that we talked about earlier between VOD and broadcast services. This blurring of boundaries starts to change viewing habits, and the whole cycle starts again, which reinforces the trend. So, I've attempted to simplify the logic of investing by genre into a flowchart. Bear with me on this. Now, this is most definitely an oversimplified way of looking at things, but I think it's an, a, good, a good initial rule of thumb. Along the way, we'll identify some of the important factors that affect content decisions, which will be shown in the blue boxes. So, one of the greatest determinants of how one might invest is the size of an operator. Now, large is a really subjective term, so I've, I've intentionally avoided putting a, an absolute defi definition on it. Large could mean that one is an incumbent in one's home market, or it could mean that one has over a million subscribers or a turnover above a certain threshold. What's certain is, if one is not a large operator by whichever definition, then focusing on lower cost content options is definitely a priority. What do we mean by lower cost content options? Again, uh, feel free to full put the, uh, the screen on full screen so you can read the, the small text I've put here. Things like low-budget scripted drama are what I'm talking about here. Uh, a colleague of mine was talking to an operator in Africa recently that was looking to bring the price of production down from $10,000 an hour of content to just $1,000 per hour. Writer's room type competitions from public service broadcasters and short form competitions from the likes of Virgin Media have all generated content at little to no cost to the operator beyond a smidgen of marketing budget. Non-scripted live content or live events are also cheap to develop, maybe 0.1 to a million dollars an hour compared to 0.5 to 3 or even 10 million dollars an hour for dramatic content. Short-form content and factual content of any length is also practical to produce on smaller budgets. If you're a larger operator, then you potentially have more options open to you, but these are dependent on the access infrastructure that you have available to you and the form factors that you have under your control. Mobile-only operators are best focusing on, for example, short-form content, but also phrase into live events and non-scripted live content could be a nice demonstration of LTE performance, for example. If one has fixed or TV assets, then there are a host of wider options available to you. Investments in sports is high risk, but potentially higher return. In some markets, such as the UK or Turkey, where most major operators can carry most premium sport content through wholesale arrangements, it's worth investigating those relationships first. Really, then, you're weighing up the opportunity cost of not investing in sports, rather than just the cost of exclusivity. Also, if you have a sizable international footprint, then you have other options available. If you're a single market player, then my earlier suggestions about low-cost options probably still apply. But if you're an operator in a few different markets, or can deliver services OTT to other countries, then there can be a basis for investing in higher budget scripted drama. We're talking half a million dollars plus per episode. On top of considering those other lower cost options. Back to sports investment. If wholesale terms aren't acceptable in a market, and it looks like there's value in exclusive ownerships of sports content, then do you have or are you prepared to provide national TV coverage? This is an important question because the value of sports is not fully realized from networks with, say, 70% population coverage. Operators such as KPN or BT can comfortably offer pay TV services over IP because their national infrastructure and coverage ensure wide enough distribution. But in the case of, say, Turk Telecom, 
their bid for premium football rights a few years ago also prompted them to invest in satellite delivery so that they could ensure full national coverage for the football rights that they acquired. If you aren't able to invest in near national coverage, then sports may not be for you. And if you can, then the return on investment is still not guaranteed, and the ROI window may be long. As we've established, sports can help to bring scale, but it can still take a long time to recoup the billions in football rights. As an operator, you need to have and be able to afford the long ROI horizon for sports investment. If you're able to do that, then you also need to be able to invest in the associated studios and production that goes around offering live coverage of sporting events. I think these costs will come down over time, especially as we see no frills broadcast of certain live sporting events, OTT, from the likes of Facebook, as I mentioned earlier, and YouTube. But now, for now, I think one needs to follow this chain of logic before taking the leap to invest significant amounts of money in sports content. And then, of course, if you're able to afford all of that, then the other options of high-budget drama and lower-cost options all become open to you. Now, as I said, this is a gross oversimplification of the reasoning around investment in content, but I hope that it helps to highlight some of the critical factors and options available to operators. My second recommendation, then, is that in general, larger operators can invest in these high-ticket items, and that smaller operators do still also have investment options. But how do they produce this content? There are a large number of options for how one invests in content, and different production modes have different pros and cons. One is always making a trade-off between risk and return. At the top end of the scale, one can produce content in-house. Here you're absorbing 100% of the cost and 100% of the risk. Total ownership gives total control, and when this works well, it can really work well. Strong flagship content can affect consumers' willingness to pay for an entire service. That's clearly demonstrated by Netflix success, uh, successes such as Orange is the New Black or Amazon Video's success with Transparent, for example. And I believe that Amazon, when screen testing pilots, explicitly asked the audience whether a particular series would increase their willingness to subscribe to Amazon Video. Of course, if you own the content, then you also have the option to export the international rights. I spoke to one operator recently who's investing in original content, and they said that they consider this to be the icing on the cake. It doesn't pay for the content, but it could help to cover, say, 10% of the production costs, which really, when you're talking about big-ticket investment, is no small amount. If one doesn't wish to absorb the full cost of in-house production, then co-production may be the answer. Co-production can mean a number of things. It could mean co-financing, for example, where one shares the risks, but also the upside for all territories. Or it can mean sharing distribution rights. So you say fund 20% of the cost of uh, production and you get uh, the European distribution rights, say. Some co-production arrangements can simply be pre-sale agreements, where you agree to pay for exclusive domestic rights in advance. Co-production allows for flexibility of cost, of risk and return. And rather than funding 100% of production costs, you're funding, say, between 10% and 50%. So it's quite a significant saving. Output deals can be affordable if you have scale, but they're really only suitable for larger players. This is where you exclusively take all content from a particular third party. This and carriage deals can allow you to gain exclusive content neatly packaged without getting your hands dirty, so to speak. But of course, carriage deals can bring other risks, particularly when negotiating contract renewals. The games that are played around blackouts of content uh, appear to be getting more extreme. Um, there was a, a spat between Sky and Discovery that, that was getting a lot of coverage last week or the week before last. Co-branded partnerships are arrangements such as, say, that which the satellite player Sky has made with Telecom Italia. They offer a co-branded TV service that bundles Sky's TV service, unmoderated, with their own telecom services. It doesn't cost them much, but it also doesn't offer much differentiation beyond buying from Sky directly. But it does have limited risk, and it's cheap to do. OT partnerships are where you say bundle Netflix with your proposition. And finally, you have wholesale arrangements. If your particular market supports them, where one can simply buy channels wholesale from rivals. This is a return to that discussion we had earlier about the cost of not doing something when it comes to sports coverage in certain markets. My conclusion and recommendation, then, is that few operators 
you should consider full-on in-house original content production. It costs a lot and the risks are quite high. The larger the company, the greater ability to handle that risk one has. But greater ownership is a good thing and it allows one access to the potential upside of selling the content outside of one's current core customer base, either OTT domestically or even internationally. I think the sweet spot is around the many different forms of co-productions, sharing risk and sharing return. So, to summarize the main points I've made in today's presentation, and I'd like to remind you that a lot more thinking behind this work, which is included in our report, there's a lot more thinking behind this work, which is included in our reports, but I've not been able to share it with you all today in the limited time that we've got. So firstly, operators must ensure that video on demand and streaming have a prominent presence in their distribution mix. The relative importance of VOD is increasing, and that affects content decisions, user experience, and all sorts. Secondly, in general, content is a scale business, and so large operators can and should consider investing in sports and scripted drama, whereas small operators can consider non-scripted entertainment and short-form content. There's an investment option available for almost all budgets. Finally, I think that the best investment strategy is generally going to be one of pooled risk. Co-productions in their various forms allow you to take on between, say, 10 and 50% of the risk and the return and spread your bets more widely. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time.